All right, so it is a few minutes after 10. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to the workshop on incorporating FAO library resources into your online courses. My name is Gina Schlesselman Parango. I'm the coordinator of library instruction. And today, um, along with three of my colleagues, um, we're going to be talking about how to make your life as an online instructor hopefully a little bit easier. Um, the way this is going to go is that um, my colleagues were each going to take a turn addressing our respective areas. Um, so we're going to start with Stacy Magadans, who is our coordinator of electronic resources and serials. Hi, Stacy. She's waving. <laughs> then we're going to move to Barbara, Barbara Corton, who is the coordinator of library media services. And then um, Kim Wabick, who is our head of access services, will speak. And then I'll, I'll wrap up um, and address instruction. We are asking that um, we hold off until the end for Q&A. There is going to be a slight bit of overlap, um, likely, in what we address today. So I'm assuming we'll answer some of those questions as we pr proceed through the presentation. Um, we are recording this session. We've had, we had a number of requests from faculty to do so, so just be aware of that. And we do ask that you mute yourself um, just so everyone can you know, clearly hear who's speaking. So before I turn it over to Stacy, we did want to run a quick poll just to get a feel for everyone's experience and comfort with um, online teaching. So in a moment, you should see a poll pop up. And the question is, have you incorporated file library resources into your online courses? Yes, a lot. Yes, but spring was my first time or never. All right, I see answers coming in. Okay, cool. So it looks like most everyone had an opportunity to complete this. So at 54%, um, 54 percent of folks have never, um, and then 31 percent have done it a lot, and then spring was the first time at 15 percent. So we have a mixed group today, which is, which is excellent, and I'm sure um, those of us who have, have done this a lot will have a lot to contribute in our discussion at the end. So I'm going to stop talking now, and I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Stacy. Okay, hello everyone. Um, I will just talk here for a minute and I am going to set my timer so that I do not go wildly over my allotted time. So you may have seen my some of my announcements this uh, quarter about how many publishers were uh, making their resources available freely, which was unusual. They had taken them from behind their paywalls uh, in order to address uh, the closures affecting higher education during COVID-19. But what happens normally when these things are behind paywalls? Uh, that means that the publishers have to control access to them in such a way that only members of subscribing institutions are able to get to them. That's done in a couple of ways. It's usually some combination of what's called IP address recognition. It means you're sitting at a computer on the campus network. It knows you belong to the campus. The other way is by uh, using a login. Um, and so we use a product that sort of streamlines this process for the user. It's called Easy Proxy. And you might say, well, I've never noticed that. And that's because when it's working correctly, you won't notice it at all it will pass you through invisibly, seamlessly, to exactly what you should have access to, which is all fine from the user's side. But if you are the person setting up the links, you need to be aware that there's a little bit of code you have to include in your links to make sure that everyone gets seamless access to what they should be getting. So to talk about that, I'm gonna share my screen with you. Just one moment here. And so now you should be seeing the library's homepage. Um, I just want to point out that there is a library guide about linking, and it will give many more details than I can give here. We do have a tile on the library's homepage for library guides, but I've also made it easy to find um, if you type the word linking into OneSearch. Uh, OneSearch will pull up a link to this guide so that you can get to it easily. Here it is, linking to library resources. 
and it has my contact information on it if you need to get in touch with me. So the basics, as it discusses here, are that you need to have a link that is stable, something uh, that you can grab onto that will be stable, that will be durable. And then you need to include with that link this bit of information, which is the library's proxy prefix. With this in mind, you can link to any of our content. You can link to full text articles. You could link to an entire database, to the homepage for a journal if you wanted your students to browse articles from that journal. You can link to one of our eBooks. You could even link to uh, searches, canned searches in some of our databases if that's something that interests you. Uh, I just want to show very quickly a little bit about articles um, because this is probably the most common thing that people want to link to. So there's two ways again that, that you could do this. Most of our products, what you would do is navigate to the article that you want. Uh, you would look at the URL in your browser and then you may need to add the library's proxy prefix to that. And so here I have an example of what a correctly prefixed uh, URL would look like. And this would be the link that you want to offer to your students. Now, because we're all working at home, so effectively we are all off campus, um, if you are not using the campus VPN, I don't know if you habitually sign into the VPN or not, but you at home then will be pushed onto the proxy without really ever knowing it. So here I've gone to, I've gone to the library's link to Wiley Online Library, I've done a search. So here is an article I would like for my students to read. Here up here in the browser uh, address bar, I have my URL. And I can actually see right here that there is a bit of code in that, which says libproxy.lib.csusb.edu. That's actually okay to use as well. I don't need to add more proxy information to this because it's already done it for me. So that, that's pretty simple. But if I had been doing this while I was on campus, sitting on the campus network, I probably wouldn't have had that in. So I would have had to manually add it in the way that it indicates here on the, on the instructions. So let's say I am off in my Blackboard course. I have here a fake course that I use for practicing links and I wanted to just add a link to this article so my students could read it. I would go to build content and I could just pick web links, the easiest, simplest way to do this. Uh, I can just do uh, R earthquakes. Now let me just do, I can't type fast enough. Pardon my typing. I would just paste in my link. I know that it has my proxy information. I could give it a description if I wanted to or not. I could just go ahead and say submit and it will then create that as a link to my article and it will then take me to it. So I don't have to make the students look for it. Um, it's just gonna take them right to it. The other common article link, oh, and I'm at six minutes, so I will make sure that I stop. Um, just one other thing I would show you, this is an EBSCOhost full text article. I'm here in one of our EBSCOhost databases. Two of our database platforms actually try their best to make this easy for you. Their URLs up at the top are not stable. You see all of this weirdo code in here. It's all linked to a session, so it won't last. But what they've done instead is over here, they've given me what's called a permalink or a durable link. And so in that case, they've made it super easy for me. They've already included the library's correct proxy information. All I have to do is copy and paste that into my Blackboard course. It's good to go. All right, so that was what I wanted to show you. I will stop sharing. Hold on one second. All right, and I will turn the mic over to Barbara, who will talk a little bit about specifics of video, and I will mute myself. 
Hi, everyone. It's great to see you all. We spend so much time emailing each other back and forth. We rarely get a visual. So let's talk about how to incorporate streaming video into your online course. The library has five streaming video databases, which I'll quickly overview today. <coughs> I won't show you how to use any of them because that would take us down a rabbit hole because <laughs> they're so fun to go through. But if, it, if at the end, if people are interested, I could set up another Zoom session to walk you through some of their features. Hold on, I'm going to set my timer here. I forgot. Okay. So, um, in the last three months, we've seen a big uptake in usage statistics for streaming video. Just as an example, between August and February, seven months, our video database, Academic Video Online, which we call Avon, had an average of 200 plays per month. In March, April, May of COVID, Avon had an average of 870 plays a month, which is huge. So you can imagine that um, we've gotten a lot more questions about how to use videos. And I'm happy to say that we have a pretty great collection across our databases. So let's say, let's, let's see how to find them, okay? Let's say you have a specific title in mind for a particular uh, video you want to see. You would just type in the title here into one search, and this is going to search all of our video databases. You need to change it to books and media. <clears throat> and remember when you get to the results, it's going to have books and media. So there's one extra step you have to take. You have to go to the left-hand side and click video. And so what you're gonna end up with is usually it's gonna be one of the, one of the first hits. Um, and you can see that this one we have as a DVD, but that's not gonna help you when you're teaching online. So you would choose this one. And you can see on this one, each time you jump into a record for a video, you're going to see where it's available. This one is in Media Education Foundation. And I'm not, as I said, I'm not gonna jump into, well, I'll jump into it, <laughs> just really briefly. And let's see if it'll pop up. Right, so there, there we have it, Consuming Kids. At this point, you would just, um, you would just go ahead and play that. Now, if you just want to browse each database on its own, you would choose a database, and then you would go down to the category video. And um, let's see. By way of a quick introduction, Avon is our biggest database with uh, nearly 70,000 videos. There are documentaries, instructional materials like presentations, um, so on, uh, lectures, interviews, counseling sessions, but because it's so big, it addresses most disciplines. Avon Local Titles is where we host the videos that we purchase on our own. So you can see the alums video 1948 is right there. We just started hosting our own videos this year. So we only have about 20 right now, but there's some great titles in there like ethnic notions, feed the green, diagnosing differences, Latino, the changing face of America. Media Ed Foundation, MEF for short, might just be my favorite. 
It has a wonderful collection of videos on gender and culture, race, representation, mass media, politics, titles like Codes of Gender, Great White Hoax, White Like Me. MEF produces and distributes its own documentaries, um, but they don't have a streaming service. So they use the Canopy platform and that's why you see Canopy up here. We also have DocuSeq2, which distributes uh, documentaries by independent filmmakers on social and environmental issues. It's a small collection of about 800 films. There's a wonderful series in here called Thinking Existence. It's a 10 part series on philosophy, politics and society. We also have Safari Tech videos. They're mostly computer science and business. This database has eBooks too, which is um, unique in our video databases. And let's see. So all of these databases are subscription based except for Canopy. Um, as long as we subscribed, we get to view all the videos in all these collections. Canopy is the only video database where you need to actually request the, uh, the title and then we will license it for you for a year. Students can't request them because we're trying to be cost effective and um, it doesn't make sense to make, to purchase, or excuse me, to license a video for $135 for only one student. So at this time, they only have access to what we have now, which is what faculty have requested. And that's about 120 databases. So what if you want to, um, what if you want to link a video in your course so Stacy has created this awesome video tips library guide for you. And again, she goes over what she talked about earlier about that ever important proxy prefix. So take a look here and we'll give you, we'll show you these, we'll provide all these links later. And then uh, they, these library guides will help you with other things. For example, if you wanna know more about Canopy, this shows you how to request a video, and it shows you our approval criteria for, for whether we can go ahead and borrow that. Oh, there's my timer. So, and the last one I wanted to show you real quick is this one, using streaming video in your course. This is a really good one. It's got ideas for assignments and lots of articles having to do or by faculty who have actually done this in their work. So now I'll go ahead and pass you over to my colleague, uh, Kim Wobick, who is the head of Access Services. Good morning, everybody. So let me share my screen with you here. And we're going to start at the library website. Um, which is where you start with everything. And so this morning, what I wanted to go over um, as many, th many of the services that um, I know a lot of you are very familiar with, such as course reserves, interlibrary loan, and then um, give you some insight into things where services uh, we're potentially looking at for future um, services as we continue in courses online. So first uh, and most importantly is course reserves. So as many of you know, uh, course reserves has its own tiles. So I'm gonna click on here. So then we can see what it looks like and you kind of get the view of what your students are looking at. And let me, so uh, the book, the information um, that about the books that you use in your courses, we actually get directly from the bookstore. And while we are not able to purchase everything uh, due to budgetary constraints, we purchase as much as we can. And traditionally that's been in print. So your student has come to the circulation desk on the first floor of the library, 
uh, asked for a book that is here for our class. We've checked it out to them for two hours. But what we're doing now, um, starting with the spring quarter, is purchasing as many ebooks as we possibly can uh, for your courses and in general. And the caveat to that, though, is unfortunately not everything is available as an ebook. So we try our best to locate it. Um, but please know that we cannot always um, get the book for whatever reason. And most of the time, uh, the reasons that kind of get in the way of us getting an ebook are on the publisher side. Uh, so, but we will continue to do our best. Uh, our collections development uh, department, headed by Lisa Bartle, I know many of you have been in contact with her. Um, she does explore different options for getting ebooks. Um, but what I wanted to talk about right now was how your students and you can access this. So, course reserves, uh, you can. Uh, we're here on the library page. You can look at this or look up a course either by the course number or by the instructor's name. So for example, if I was in chemistry 215 or 216, and what I'm gonna do is just show you what that ebook looks like. It's very similar to looking at journal articles, videos online, and embedding these in your course. Uh, I would refer you back to the library library guides that Stacy put together uh, for what links you would put into your course. So here's my class, Chem 216, and it's going to tell me what books that we have on reserve for this class. And so for the location for this one, it says online. So I'm going to click through. I clicked on the title uh, just to give you a sense of what it looked like. If you haven't looked at an ebook um, lately, there, we have many different platforms that ebooks are available on. They're all different. Uh, as I like to say about our databases, they all have the same features, but presented in different ways. So it's kind of good to expect that you're going to be looking at a different screen uh, every time you click a link, uh, especially for an ebook. This particular chemistry book happens to be from the Open Textbook Library, so I'm going to click on that. And then it's going to give me some options on how I can look at this book. And right away, it gives me the table of contents. So we won't necessarily link to a specific page. Uh, you can definitely do that in your class, in your Blackboard class, but we will get your student to the book. So if we take a look at reserves in another way, I'm gonna go back to the search and I'm going to search for an instructor's name. My instructor for this class happens to be Norris, and I'm in um, Criminal Justice 629. And so the same thing. However, so we've got two books here, and you notice one's on in print to our reserves and the other one's online. So I could also click through to that, and you'll see that this is in a different database. So this one is from EBSCO, which we're all familiar with. Um, that's where some of our most in, uh, inclusive uh, databases as far as subject areas are. And they also include um, eBooks. And you'll notice that looks very different, um, but it has many of the same features. You can get to a part of the book by clicking on the um, table of contents, and there's many different features here, which we won't go into now. But just so you know, that's that's what that looks like. And you may see this sometimes as well. We also have this particular title in a number of different databases. So that's sometimes a nice feature to have. Um, one thing I should point out is what's particularly important for eBooks is how many users the publisher will allow at any given time of to use this book. This particular book, we do have unlimited copies available. So whenever you click on into a database that has the ebook, there will be uh, one of the categories will be what the availability is that is for that particular title. Um, most likely you will see either unlimited copies, hopefully more, more so than not, uh, three users or one users or one user, and those are limits set by the publisher. So we try to work with you as much as we can, uh, as 
especially if the book is needed for a class, you're obviously going to need um, the availability that more than one person will be able to use the book at once. Uh, so one thing I wanted to focus on, let's go back to the reserves list for this class and talk about this one that's only available in print. Um, and it's here onto our reserve. So it's sitting in the library right now, but unfortunately nobody can check it out. So what would you do in that case? Um, many of you may have seen the emails and I'll be sending out another one soon about um, a limited uh, time scanning service that the Access Services Department is providing, uh, the Circulation Department. And I will be sending out a link to a form and all I ask you to do is put in uh, the book that you need, you have on reserve for your class or that's required for your class and what pages you need out of it. So that brings us to the issue of copyright. And I just wanna give everybody a quick reminder of the fact that if we only have a book in print, we can explore to see if it's available in, as an ebook copy, and we definitely will do that. Um, but if it's not, I cannot scan the whole book for you. We can only scan uh, what you need for the class. So really, we always have to be considering copyright, and there are many copyright guidelines, but what allows us as a library and an educational institution uh, to use these resources um, for our class is the concept of fair use. And you'll see that there's five different categories here. And the use, how we use um, books, textbooks, whether they be textbooks or um, books like memoirs or things like that, um, really fall under the uh, fair use guidelines because they're being used for educational resources more often than not. Um, we're only using a small portion of the text. So if you needed a couple chapters scanned from a book, uh, we could possibly do that from you or for you. And Kim, I'm, yeah. I'm sorry, are we supposed to be seeing a slide right now? Oh, you can't see it? No, we see the, um, the CJS 629. Oh, no. Okay, one moment, please. I did not anticipate that. I thought when I changed my screen that it would change with me. Um, let me share. I do apologize for that. Okay, let me, here we go. Can you see the slide now? Awesome. I do apologize for that, everybody. Um, and I will make sure that this, uh, basically it's a quick guide to considering uh, how your work or how the use of a textbook fits into fair use um, when you need a digital copy. Oh, and there's my timer. Okay. Um, but basically because we're using these books for educational use, your students will be using them on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Um, that you're not going to make a scan of an entire book and give it to your class. And the fact that it's password protected in your Blackboard um, also helps uh, with the use of the textbook. So if you have other questions about that, you can definitely ask um, one of the librarians. But I just wanna put out there that I'm not able to scan a whole textbook for you if we only have it in print, but we can try to work something out. So please contact me. Let me go back to the library website real quick. And a couple of reminders that I wanted to give everybody uh, would be uh, our interlibrary loan service, which is free to all um, faculty, staff, and students. And you can request an interlibrary loan here from this button. It takes you directly into the software. And as a reminder, you can request book chapters and journal articles that we do not have in the file library databases at this time. Uh, we are not requesting books. Uh, that's something that we're in discussion about with the other CSUs and other libraries right now. As you can imagine, across the educational landscape, everybody, all institutions are trying to figure out what that looks like, how to increase um, services that are provided and how to make the collections more available. So you'll be hearing more uh, from us 
as the summer term goes on. And a couple, in light of that, a couple things that we're exploring um, different services, possibly for fall, to really expand the use of the collection for um, all faculty and students is possibly having an expanded scanning service um, from the books in the file library collection um, or possibly some kind of digital um, lending service. So you'll be hearing more about that. Like I said, we're looking at some options. If you have any questions about anything, um, feel free to um, send us an email. And now I'm going to turn it over to Gina. And so thank you so much. Thanks, Kim. Um, let me just go ahead and pull up the website here. Okay, um, so I'm gonna be talking a little bit about um, resources to help you um, incorporate critical information literacy into your courses. Um, I know a lot of us um, have some sort of research assignment for students. Um, and so there's a lot of um, things we offer that can help you scaffold that so that when the final products do, they give you, give you quality stuff. So um, I'm gonna navigate to services right here. Um, and on the bottom right, we have services for faculty. And there's a lot here, um, including information about course reserves, et cetera. But what I wanna navigate to first is request an instruction session. Um, I know a lot of you who are here in this call um, have taken advantage of library instruction before, but if you haven't, um, we essentially will um, come to your class and when, when we say that now we're going to be doing so virtually right but um, a librarian will come to your class and work and collaborate with you on doing a session for your students that speaks to your specific assignment and or learning goals um, if you are interested in, in, in that, we ask that you do submit this request. I won't walk through this form in detail, um, but essentially um, we're gonna ask you, you know, your preferred date and time, number of students, all that good stuff. Um, we also have here, you can see preferred mode of instruction. So in this online environment, um, we are happy to, to use Zoom to do synchronous sessions with your students. Um, but I know a lot of us prefer asynchronous teaching and I know there are pros and cons of both. So you also have the option um, to work with your librarian to do something sort of pre-recorded. And we do ask that if you um, request a synchronous session that as a as the faculty member you be there. Um, we've learned over the years that if the faculty member isn't there, the instructor isn't there, students sometimes have sometimes have questions about the class or the assignment that we're simply not able um, to answer. And it also helps um, make sure students attend the session if you're there. Um, the other <clears throat> piece here is that we ask that you attach either your assignment or three things that you want your students to learn. Be as specific as possible. If you type in, you want your students to learn how to do research, that doesn't necessarily help us prepare. So the more specific, the better. Um, and then you'll just hit submit. That request will come directly to my email. And so usually within a couple of days, um, I will get back to you um, with the name of, of the librarian who is able to work with you, um, the time and date and all of that good stuff. Um, we do ask that you submit your instruction request at least a week in advance. That's even more important now, I feel, because of course everyone is just in this sort of weird, hectic schedule. So the more time that we have to prepare, the better, of course. Okay, so that is instruction. Um, I'm going to return to services where I started and navigate back to services for faculty. And I want to show off the CIL lab. CIL means critical information literacy. You might have heard this term. Um, this essentially is our approach to information literacy, where we um, like to stress critical thinking about information, um, such as its production, how it's disseminated, and how it's accessed. And so if this is new to you, or if you're interested in exploring it more, I want to point out some of the tools we have here. Um, I won't have time to cover everything on this page. But the two most important pieces here, um, the first is Instructor's Corner. And this is essentially um, a plethora of resources for you if you are interested in incorporating CIL into your um, research assignments. So this page is um, 
structured around SLO student learning outcomes. And these are um, SLOs for the library instruction program. So you can see we're interested in free versus fee based information, right? And what that means that some information is behind a paywall and some isn't. Effective searching, popular and scholarly sources, um, the differences and utility of those types, what shapes information and then attribution. So if you were interested, for example, in exploring attribution or citation in your course, what you can do is um, open up this SLO and then you'll see we have discussion prompts, activities, um, videos, related resources, infographics, all sorts of good stuff here that you can explore. The nice thing too is that a lot of this um, you can easily modify, you know, depending on your class level um, and, and make it work with your other course learning outcomes as well. If I pop back into Instructor's Corner, we also have a list of recommended readings and videos and also CIL assignments from CSUSB faculty, which I'm going to open up here. Um, a few years ago, we were hosting a CIL faculty award program where a librarian worked with um, faculty to develop assignments for their course. Um, this winter, we also worked um, through the GE program to offer some professional development. And so here we have um, some assignments that came out of that work. We have um, gotten permission, of course, from the faculty members to share the information here. Um, but if you're interested, you can browse these two um, for ideas. So the final piece here in the CIL lab um, that I want to point out is video tutorials. And I know a lot of folks have been using these for um, online teaching. Video tutorials um, are basically a, a slate or a number of videos um, followed by an online quiz that students can take. So you'll notice that we have these for three levels, beginning researchers, whoops, intermediate researchers and advanced researchers. So by beginning, we mean um, first year students, maybe transfer students who haven't used our resources before. Um, intermediate would be, you know, upper division students and advanced researchers um, would be grad students. But of course, it's, you know, it's up to you on, you know, what you want to cover with your students. Um, but let's take a look at tutorial two, just so you can have a better understanding of what this looks like. So each of these is a video. I'll click on this first one, peer review. And above each video, it lists the, the student learning outcomes. Again, these are the library learning outcomes that, that, that the video addresses. And below you have some vocabulary terms. These vocabulary terms also show up on the quiz. So um, make sure if you assign these to your students, you, you point that out to actually do, do the small bit of reading that accompanies each um, piece of media here. And then you can navigate through this tutorial at the bottom. It'll take you to our next video here, which is about the literature. Navigate to the final video here, which is about um, data, intermediate database searching. And then when we get to the end, it's taking a second to load here. Here we go. Um, what we see is the quiz. Um, these quizzes are about 20 questions, so they're not um, too onerous as, as far as student time. Um, and students can take them as often as they want, but the quizzes cover the, vid the content in the videos as well as those vocabulary terms that I pointed out. Um, What's nice too is once students complete the quiz, they get a PDF, a digital certificate that they can either email to you or upload to your Blackboard space. Um, and again, each of these tutorials, the beginners, intermediate, and advanced, they have a separate quiz. So if you, if you, know, if you wanna go wild, you can assign, assign all three. Um, the, the certificate of completion lists the student score. So what I recommend and what I've done in classes I've taught before is ask that students um, take it as many times as they need to, but require that they at least, you know, get like an 80% or whatever, you know, wherever, wherever you want to put that bar. Um, and then once they do that, they upload that. It will also have, the certificate also has their name on it. So you'll have that evidence that they've completed the task. Um, so these are all open access. So you don't have to worry about doing any, you know, proxy linking or anything like you would need to do for our articles. You could simply um, navigate to the quiz of choice. Let me go here. Um, this one, 
and then you would just share the link up here in Blackboard. Um, I have reached out to ATI to see um, if we can collaborate on maybe creating these as modules in the Blackboard space, but um, we're still working on that. So for now, you can just link this way. Okay, I'm gonna go back to the library's homepage and just point out a few more things before we open it up for Q&A. <clears throat> You've probably seen emails from me um, about our workshop series. So we have this workshops tile on the home page. Um, <clears throat> and you obviously registered for this workshop, um, but, but your students can attend these. Um, some faculty will assign extra credit for students who attend and we can um, always shoot an email afterwards to confirm that um, the student attended. We recently did a library survey and got feedback that folks wanted recordings of these workshops. Um, we've always had those, but we realized it wasn't obvious where those were. So if you click here, it says calendar registration and recordings. And navigate to recorded online workshops at the bottom. This will plop you into our YouTube um, channel and our recorded online workshops playlist. Um, and so we're always updating this and adding to it. Our YouTube channel in general is a really good resource of videos on all sorts of topics. So those workshops were just a slice of what we have. Um, we have this social media um, link on our homepage here. And so if you go into the YouTube um, channel, you'll see all sorts of good stuff. Um, <clears throat> earlier we mentioned library guides. So not only do we have guides for faculty for things like linking to library resources and using video, but these can be really useful for students. Um, I'll just open up citing and writing here and you can see we have all of these citation guides. And again, we're continually updating this content. Um, we can create a guide for your class. I know some of you here um, have, have collaborated on that with our librarians before. So um, we're, we're all about you know, tailoring materials to what you need to the extent possible. And I will just wrap up um, by pointing out that um, if your students ever need help, that we have many ways to reach us virtually, including um, this Ask a Librarian chat option here where they can actually chat live with, with one of us. Um, and there are other options here. I'm not sure if you can actually see this box that opened, um, but you can email us, text us, call us, you know, et cetera. We also are available to meet students and faculty through research appointments right here. Um, and we're now doing offering these through Zoom um, and they can select um, a staff member, a librarian, or it defaults to no preference and a date and time. And then we can set that up um, to meet with you or your students. So I'm going to stop for now. We have 15 minutes, so we've got plenty of time for Q&A. Um, I will go ahead and sort of monitor that chat and act as the moderator. And I would just ask my colleagues to, um, you know, step in when a question comes up that they can address. All right, so let me review this chat here. Oh, and Stacy has been feverishly sharing all these links, so we appreciate it. Okay, so Sunny asks, question about copyright. If I post a PDF of a journal article or scan chapter from a book that the library or its databases does not own to my Blackboard site, and I keep posting that chapter to my Blackboard site every time I teach the course, is that considered fair use? I remembered reading at one point that I could only post such a chapter once, i.e. one quarter, not quarter after quarter, due to the need to meet a spontaneous use criterion for fair use. Does that criterion still apply in current understandings of fair use? Thanks. So I would default to Kim or Stacy on this one. Uh, I can chime in and I'm sure Stacy will have extra information as well. Uh, in terms of posting quarter after quarter, if it's a book we don't own and you find that you are continually using a resource for your class, I would definitely reach out to the library so that we can buy it. Um, it's always better if the library owns something that you are going to use in your class. Um, with that said, uh, the fact that you're only posting it to Blackboard so your students have to enter a password to access that material is also helpful. Um, but probably the best thing to do would make sure that the library owns the material you own or you want to use. Yeah, the, um, the spontaneity um, exception that, that Sunny mentions isn't actually written into fair use. 
um, the fair use criterion is the four the four factor test. The spontaneity criterion comes from what used to be called the guidelines for classroom copying back in the days of photocopying. It was originated in the 70s. And it did allow what people generally call the, um, the spontaneity uh, exception, meaning if it, you needed it right then for the class and you couldn't get uh, permission to use it, you, you got a pass for the first time you used it. But after then, it was assumed that you know you're going to need this from now on. You need to get copyright permission. So strictly speaking, um, no, using the same thing over and over again does not fall under either of those criteria. But as Kim said, um, maybe we can get a licensed copy of it. Um, check with us. We'll certainly do our best to do that. Were there any other questions? You're, you're free to unmute. Everyone is muted. So if you're trying to talk, you'll need to unmute yourself first. Yes, I have a question. This is Fadi Mahidat, Computer Science and Engineering. Um, I teach engineering classes, so sometimes I use the IEEE uh, papers or journals. Uh, for each to the students, I download them using my account or like my professional account or from the university network, and I put them in a Blackboard. Is that a recommended or just provide the links uh, on a Blackboard would be safer uh, uh, behavior? I can speak to that. We do have an IEEE subscription. Um, I don't know if it covers precisely the same content that you've been using in your course, but but we have an IEEE the, the subscription that covers most of their content. So the thing about linking out is that linking does not make you a copy. You have evaded copyright restrictions because you haven't made a copy. You've linked to uh, a licensed version of that for the campus. So we would always encourage people to link. Um, you can link to items in IEEE. They do have stable links. So yes, and Kim is, Kim is affirming what I'm saying in the chat. <laughs> linking is always best um, because as I say, linking gets around the copyright restrictions because there is no copy. Thank you. And I wanted to add another thing about why linking is really good as well. So not only um, does it fall within fair use and you're solidly there, but if you're using library resources, it helps us at the library know that you're using our resources. So we really would like to have you link when always when possible. Yeah, I mean, what I did, I basically used the library. I downloaded them from the library, but you know, students sometimes, even though you say tomorrow we have this, you have to keep repeating, repeating, sending instructions. So it was easier for me to have them like, you know, just one spot, this is the data. You don't have any issue accessing that from off campus, on campus, using smartphones, et cetera, et cetera. That's why uh, I, I put it that way, but I, I would go with your recommendation kind of next time, hopefully with the, the linking. Yeah, I appreciate yeah. the answer. And by all means, if you ever need help with a link, just let me know. I'm very happy to help people construct them. It's no problem at all. Appreciate that. Thank you so much. Any other questions? I have a quick question. Um, probably it's not possible to answer it now, but I just want to know who can I work with to um, to find out more. First of all, thank you so much. Every time I browse library resources, I always find something new and very helpful. And this workshop has been very, very helpful. Um, so my question is, uh, I also included it in um, like a question box when I signed up. Um, I'm thinking about like uh, developing something like a play pose it um, videos with incorporated questions for the APA style guide. I know you have a very extensive guide and I do have it embedded in my courses. I was wondering if there was a way to work with someone to create an interactive video with the uh, questions so that students can learn better about the APA style. Thank you. Yeah, I, I thank you for reminding me. I saw your request in the registration form and I, I already reached out to my colleague Lisa who has put together all of our APA content. Um, so what I'll do is um, I will go ahead and send you her email address so you can connect with her, but she said that she's definitely interested in exploring something like that this summer. 
Thank you. Anything else? Oh, thank you, Alam. <laughs> um, before we head out, folks, I'm, I am going to share a link to a survey in the chat um, box. We were hoping to um, develop either offer more workshops like this or develop more for faculty this summer to just, you know, support y'all as much as possible before we move um, fully online for our first fall semester. Um, so if you could please provide us some feedback that would be really useful as we develop those um, additional workshops. So I will go ahead and plop that link in the chat. And if you just take a minute to complete that survey, it'd be great. And then um, my colleagues and I can hang out for a few minutes, but if, if, that's, if that's it, then thanks again for attending and um, best of luck this summer as you prep your courses. It's really great to see everybody. Thank you. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you Bye. all. Bye. Tina, should we stop recording if, if people have questions? Yes, will do. Thank you for reminding me. I always forget.